Python variables, data types, and data structures. In this segment, I'm going to talk about variables, data types, and data structures. Before getting into too much detail, you should know where to look for Python documentation. You can find a lot of documentation online, and probably the best place to start is python.org. If you go to docs.python.org, you can locate the documentation for the most current version of Python. Here you'll find plenty of references and even some tutorials. Take a moment to bookmark this page for later reference. While I'm going to teach you the basics in this class, for the most part, you're going to have to learn a lot on your own. If you want to become good at programming, you'll have to take the initiative and practice as often as you can. Looking at all the documentation available, you might feel intimidated. You shouldn't feel as if you have to read everything. In fact, most people don't. Instead, use the documentation as a reference when you need to look something up. Variables. Variables in Python have several different data types. But the three most common are numeric, string, and boolean. These data types should sound familiar because they are also used in geospatial science. So what's a variable? Python uses variables to store information. A variable works like a container. It stores a value in computer memory. The variable's name is used as a reference by the computer to retrieve that data from memory. You define a variable using what is called an assignment statement, which has three main parts, the variable name, the assignment operator, and the value. For example, area equals 300 is an assignment statement. The word area is a variable name, the equal sign is called an assignment operator, and the number 300 is the value that gets stored in computer memory. The variable area also has a numeric data type. Python uses what is called dynamic assignment. Dynamic assignment means that the data type of the variable is implicit in the value that you assign. So in this case, 300 is a numeric value, specifically it is an integer. So the variable area has an integer data type. You can check this yourself using a built-in function called type. I'll add a new line and use the type function. This time I will run the cell using a keyboard shortcut, shift enter. When I run the cell, it returns int, which stands for integer. You can also change the variable data type automatically by assigning it a new value. So I'll change the number 300 to 300.0 and run the cell again. This time I get a float as the data type. There are two common numeric data types that you'll work with in this class, integers and floating point, or float for short. An integer is a whole number with no decimal places. A floating point is a fractional number, so it includes a decimal point. I'll talk more about working with numbers later. I'll demonstrate again. This time I'm going to put a pair of quotations around the number, which indicates to Python that the value inside the quotation marks is a string. When I run the cell again, the type function returns str, which stands for string. This means that Python will treat the area variable as text instead of a number. This has some important implications. Suppose my area represents square feet and I want to convert it into square meters. First, I'm going to comment out my type function by placing a pound sign in the front. Whenever you place a pound sign in your code, Python treats what comes after as a comment and does not run that code. I'll add a new line and multiply the area times the conversion. Now I get a type error. The message says, can't multiply sequence by nonint of type float. What it's basically saying is that you can't multiply text data types with numeric data types. There may be times when you want to treat numbers as strings. For example, state and county codes 
are often stored as strings in attribute tables containing census data. Variable naming conventions. As a programmer, you have a lot of freedom when it comes to picking names for your variables. However, keep in mind that others need to be able to read and understand your code. For this reason, Python has some naming conventions that you should follow. Use lowercase letters, digits, and underscores only. Don't use spaces, special characters, or capital letters. Begin your variable name with a letter. Don't begin with numbers or underscores. Don't use Python keywords as variable names. You'll learn more about keywords later. Don't use functions as variable names. For example, you shouldn't use the word print or type as a variable name because there are built-in functions that use that same name. Use descriptive names, but keep the name short. Remember that others need to read and understand your code. Separate multiple words with underscores. A good resource for learning about naming and formatting conventions is the PEP8 Style Guide for Python Code. You can find this documentation at python.org slash dev slash peps slash pep-0008. Eventually, you'll be expected to comply with all aspects of the style guide when you write longer scripts. For now, I'll try to mention specific style conventions as they relate to the topic at hand. Statements versus expressions. Earlier, I mentioned that you can define a variable using an assignment statement. This was only one kind of statement. In programming, a statement is a command or instruction for the computer to follow. For example, the code print hello world is a statement because you're telling the computer to print something to the screen. Assigning a value to a variable like cell size equals 30 is a statement because you're telling the computer to store a value in memory. Anytime you use code to tell the computer to do something, you're writing a statement. An expression, on the other hand, is code that returns a value. For example, 100 minus 70 is an expression because when I run the cell, it returns a value of 30. An arithmetic expression like this one has operators and operands. The numbers 170 are called operands, and the minus sign is called an operator. If I were to write cell size equals 100 minus 70, it would change this code from an expression into a statement because it does not return a value. To get the value out of this statement, I would have to do something like use the print function. The difference between statements and expressions is subtle, but as a programmer, these are concepts that you should be aware of. Mathematical expressions. As I mentioned earlier, you'll be working with two common numeric data types in this course, integers and floating point. Integers are whole number with no decimals. Floating point numbers have a decimal place. Python comes with some standard arithmetic operations built in. I'll cover some of the basic ones here. The minus sign is an operator used for subtraction, like 10 minus 7 which returns a value of 3. Likewise, the plus sign is the operator for addition, 10 plus 7. The forward slash is the operator for division. Notice that this expression returns a floating point value, even though 10 and 7 are integers. This expression uses what is called floating point division. Python uses a float to capture the fractional part of the expression. If you use an expression with two forward slashes, you get floor division. Don't confuse this with rounding. Floor division truncates the number to zero decimal places. Anything after the decimal place just gets lopped off. The next operator I want to talk about is the percent sign, which stands for modulus. Modulus is the remainder left over after division. So 10 percent sign 7 returns 3. Multiplication is pretty straightforward. You use the asterisk as the operator. 10 times 7 returns 70. 
One thing I should mention is that whenever you use a mathematical expression that includes one or more floating point numbers, the returned value will always be floating point. So for example, if we changed 10 to 10.0 and multiplied by 7, we would get 70.0. Last, there is an exponent operator which uses two asterisks. 10 to the power of 7 gives you 100 million. Working with string data types. Earlier I mentioned that you can designate a value as a string by enclosing it in a pair of quotation marks. You can use a pair of single quotes or a pair of double quotes. Single quotes are special characters in Python. The opening mark indicates where the string begins, and the ending mark indicates where the string ends. For example, if I enter zone code equals 2a and then use the type function, I get a string. I get the same result from the type function if I use single quotes. If I don't include either one, I get an error. Whatever you decide to use is fine. However, you need to be consistent. Don't use double quotes for some variables and single quotes for others without good reason. Personally, I prefer using double quotes so that I don't have problems when using apostrophes. Let me show you what I mean. Suppose I have the variable message equals how's it going? And then I print the message. I get an error because Python sees the first mark as the start of the string and then it encounters the apostrophe, which it thinks of as the end of the string. What comes after makes no sense to Python, so you get an error. If I change the single quotes to double quotes, I don't get that problem. There may be times when you want to include quotation marks as part of the string, or perhaps you want to use single quotes and need to include an apostrophe. In this instance, you need to use an escape sequence, which consists of an escape character followed by a special character that you need to treat differently. In Python, the backslash is the escape character that begins the escape sequence. For example, let's change the message back to single quotes and add a backslash before the apostrophe. When we print this message, we no longer get an error. In this instance, the character immediately after the backslash is treated as text and not a special character, like quotation marks. Together they make an escape sequence. So you might be thinking, what if I need to type a backslash, like for a file path? In that instance, you would need to use double backslashes. The first backslash works to escape the second one. Here's an example. If I used a variable called file path and set it to value of a string with a folder called nix folder, then I print the file path, I get an error because Python wants to use the backslash and the n as an escape sequence. Backslash n creates a new line. I need to add another backslash so that the Python treats the second one as text. Now when I print the file path, I get the results I expected. There are different strategies for using file paths, and I'll go over that at a later time. Another thing you can do with strings is called concatenation. For example, I'll create two variables that hold strings. The first one is going to be g equals geo, and the second one is going to be s equals spatial. Now what I can do is I can print both of them and concatenate them using a plus sign. It may appear counterintuitive to use arithmetic operators on strings. However, when you consider that strings are simply sequences of characters, it makes sense to combine the existing sequences into a new one. The easiest way to combine things is with a plus operator. When combining strings to form a new string, you may want to add spacing in between using double quotation marks around a space. For example, I'm going to add another variable called psi and assign it a value of science. Now, if I want to print this as two words using concatenation, 
I'm going to have to capture a space so that I'll have geospatial science as two words instead of one. Strings can contain numeric characters. However, when trying to combine strings and numbers, numbers first must be converted into a string. Consider the following example. Temperature equals 100. Now I want to print out a statement that says, today it is 100 degrees, and I want to use the temperature variable as a value in my print statement. So I'll type in uh, print and then create a string, today it is. I'll use, uh, I'll add a space after the word is and then add the variable temperature. And then I'll add the ending string, space degrees. So when I print this, I get a type error. You can only concatenate strings and not ints to strings. What Python is trying to tell me is that I need to convert the value of temperature into a string before I can use it in concatenation. To do this, I can use the string function to convert the variable temperature into a string. So now when I run the cell, it says today is 100 degrees. Converting the value of the variable from one type to another is known as casting. In terms of writing programs, string concatenation can become a bit cumbersome. A better alternative is to employ what's called string formatting, which provides a more flexible and robust approach to the use of strings. There are several approaches to string formatting. One of the most widely used techniques is the use of the format method. Its most basic usage is to insert a value into a string using a placeholder or a replacement field. Consider the following example. I'll add a placeholder using a pair of curly braces. Then right after the string, I'm going to use the format method. So I type in dot format and pass in temperature as the argument. This approach to string formatting is not limited to a single replacement field. So I'll take our previous example and make it a little more complex by adding two variables, one for Fahrenheit and the other for Celsius. When you use multiple replacement fields, you can leave the brackets empty or you can use an index number. Um, however, you can't mix the two or you'll get an error. By default, the arguments of the format method are expected to be in the same order as the replacement fields. The index numbers are optional. However, the index numbers make it possible to use arguments out of order. You also have a third option for formatting strings. You can use what is called an F string. So basically, what you do is right before your opening quotation marks, you print the letter F. Then you continue with your opening quotation and your string, and then you can include the variables directly inside a pair of brackets. So I'll show you in this next example. Personally, I think the best option is using the F strings because they're concise, readable, and convenient. They're also fast and less prone to error. Boolean data types. Python also works with Boolean logic, which is built around the truth value of expressions and objects. Many expressions are evaluated in a Boolean context, which allows you to evaluate conditions, like whether they are true or false and it decides how to proceed depending on the result of those conditions. Boolean logic is implemented in Python in various ways, including a Boolean data type, Boolean variables, Boolean expressions, 
and logical operators. Python provides a Boolean data type, which can only have one of two values, true or false. For example, you can check to see whether a variable has a certain value or not, and the result can only be true or false. The following code assigns a number to a variable and then checks to see whether this number is bigger than another number. So I'll write cell size equals 30, and then I'll write the expression cell size greater than 10. And when I run the cell, I get true because 30 is greater than 10. A single equal sign is used for an assignment statement, whereas a double equal sign is used to check whether two objects have the same value. So for this next expression, I'll put cell size double equal sign 10, which is checking if cell size is equal to 10. And when I run the cell, I get false because the cell size is 30 and not 10. These two expressions use what is called comparison operators. So the comparison operators include the double equal sign, the not equal sign, the less than sign, the greater than sign, and a few others. You can also create variables with the Boolean data type. So I'll convert my expression into a variable using an assignment statement. Check equals cell size not equals 10. And then when I run the cell, it returns true. Next, I'll use the type function on the variable check just to verify that it's a Boolean data type. The Boolean values true and false are case sensitive. So you have to use an uppercase T and an uppercase F. So I'll show you an example. I'm going to assign the variable A to the value of true. Then I'll run the type function. Everything looks okay so far, and I get bool as the data type. Bool stands for Boolean. I'll try again, and this time I will use uh, lowercase t. So that produces a name error. Name true is not defined. You also can't use quotations around the word true. If you do so, then you'll end up with a string. Boolean expressions can also use logical operators using the Python keywords and, or, or not. That might sound familiar from your geospatial courses. However, in this case, um, the and, or, and not is going to be lowercase. I'll create a variable, a equals true, and then I'll write the expression not a. When I run the cell, I get a value of false. The not operator checks for the reverse of a condition. The and and the or operator are used to compare two Booleans. The or operator results in true if either Boolean is true. So I'll create two variables, a equals true and b equals false. And then I'll use the or operator to compare them a or b. So in order for it to return true, only one of these has to be true. So I'll run the cell and I get true. In contrast, the AND operator requires both A and B to be true. So if I write the expression A and B, and then run the cell, I get false, because while A is true, B is false, so A and B returns false. In this next segment, I'm going to talk about data structures. In Python, data structures are elements that are organized in a meaningful way. 
The first data structure I'll go over is called a sequence, or sometimes called an iterable. Strings and other Python sequences, such as lists, have an index positioning system, which uses a range of values enclosed in brackets. Each character in a string is assigned an index number. Python is a zero based language, which means that the first character in a sequence starts with the index of zero. Spaces are counted like any other character. Consider the following string city name equals Los Angeles. To start, I'll use the length function to get the length of the city name. When I run the cell, I get 11, which means there are 11 characters in my string city name. That includes the space in between the word Los and Angeles. Each of the letters, and including the space, has an index number. So L will have an index number of 0, O will have an index number of 1, S will have an index number of 2, the blank space has an index number of 3, and so on. So you can use the print function to call a specific letter in a string by using the index number. So I'll type in print city name, and then in brackets I'll type in zero. And when I run the cell, I get L, because L is the first character in the string and has an index of zero. I'll try again, and this time I'll change the index to 1, which should return O. And then I'll demonstrate again by changing it to 2, which should return S. You can also use negative numbers as indexes. So negative numbers wrap around the string and start from the end. So zero is still the first character in the string, but negative one is going to return the last character in the string. So I'll print city name minus one, and I get S from the end of the word Angelus. Using negative numbers can be useful because you can get the last item without knowing the exact count. Obtaining an individual character from a string is called indexing. So for any given string, you can point to a specific character using two different index numbers, a positive index on the basis of forward indexing and a negative index on the basis of reverse indexing. You can also slice strings into smaller strings. Slicing uses two indices separated by a colon. The first index is the number of the first character you want to include. The second index is the number of the first character you do not want to include. For example, the following code slices the variable city name starting with the fifth index and up to but not including the tenth index. So when I run the cell, I get N-G-E-L-E. I'll change the 5 to a 4 so that now I get A-N-G-E-L-E -E because the letter A in Angelus has an index number of 4. So if I wanted to slice out the word angel from Los Angeles, I'll have to use a 9 because the L in angel is the eighth character. And to capture that, I'll have to go one number higher. Leaving out one of the indices means that you are not putting a limit on the range. For example, the following code returns a string consisting of the characters starting with the index number 4, up to and including the highest index number or the last character. On the other hand, the following code returns a string 
consisting of the characters starting with the lowest index number, which is 0, and up to but not including index number 3. Working with lists. Lists are a versatile Python data type and can be manipulated in many ways. You create a list using a pair of square brackets. So I'll create a list of cities. Cities equals, I'll include Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Then I'll print my list. The number of items in a list can be determined using Python's built-in length function. In this instance, there are five cities in my cities list. Lists can be sorted using the sort method. The default sorting is alphanumerical. So now when I print my cities list, you can see that the cities are listed in alphabetical order. You can reverse the order by using the reverse argument. Reverse equals true. Just be sure to spell reverse correctly. So now the list of cities is in reverse alphabetical order. Lists in Python are sequences, just like strings. Therefore, just like strings, Python lists are indexed, starting with the index of zero. For example, I can grab the second item in the list by typing in the cities variable and then a 1 enclosed in square brackets. So in this case, I get San Francisco because San Francisco is the second item on the list. I'll try again using a negative 1. Negative 1 returns the last item on the list, which is Los Angeles. If I wanted to get the second from the last item on the list, I'll enter a negative 2. The use of indices does not modify the original list, but simply obtains the item from the list as a value. You can also slice lists into smaller lists. This works just like slicing strings. Slicing uses two indices separated by a colon. The first index is the number of the first element you want to include. The second index is the number of the first element that you do not want to include. Let me demonstrate. I'll slice cities using an index of 2 and 4. So it should include the third item in the list, and it should not include the fourth item in the list, but everything in between. Whenever you slice a list, it returns a new list. And you can see here that the output is uh, surrounded by brackets, which indicates that the output is a list. I'll create a list with only one value in it, state equals California. So now when I use a single index number, it returns the value of a single item, in this case, a string. Another important list operation determines membership using the in keyword. It checks whether something is true and returns a value of true or false. So in this example, um, I'm going to check to see if New York is in my cities list. So I'll type in uh, New York in cities. And when I run the cell, I get false. Um, I'll check another city. I'll type in Seattle in cities. And when I run that cell, it returns true because Seattle is in the cities list. I'm going to print the cities list again so that we can check the contents and compare the original to what I'm about to do next. Elements in a list 
can be deleted using the delete statement. So if I type in DEL, which stands for delete, and then cities three, the three index indicates that the fourth city in the list is going to get deleted. So in this case, the fourth city is Portland. So I'll run that. And now when I print the cities list, you can see that Portland is no longer in the list. Deleting something from the list also changes the index number. So now if I use the index number three, I get Los Angeles, which uh, index three used to be Portland, but now Los Angeles is the fourth item in the list. In addition to using index numbers, you can manipulate lists using list methods. So the first one I'll show you is called the append method, and it appends an element to the end of the list. So if I type in cities.append and then type in New York, it's going to add New York to the end of my list. I'll print it out so that you can see. The count method determines the number of times an element occurs in a list. So for example, I'll create a new list of numbers where I'll have some numbers that repeat. Then I'll use the count method to see how many times one appears in the list. And I get an output of three, because one appears three times in my list. The extend method allows you to append several values at once. So what I'll do is I'll extend my cities list and I'll pass in the numbers list. So everything from the numbers list is going to get added to the cities list. The index method finds the index of the first occurrence of a value. So passing in New York into the index method, I get an index of 4 as the result, because New York has an index of 4. If I had New York um, more than one time in the list, like let's say I had New York at the end, the um, cities.index New York would still return 4, because it only returns the first instance of whatever you're trying to find. The insert method makes it possible to insert an element into a list at a specific location. So for example, if I did cities.insert and then I passed in a zero and then comma Las Vegas, it's going to insert Las Vegas at the beginning of the list because zero is the index of the first thing on a list. The pop method removes an element from a list at a specific location and returns the value of this element. So if I did cities.pop6, it's going to remove the one and return it as well. I'll print the list again so that you can see that one that was at the index of six is now um, gone from the list. The remove method removes the first occurrence of a value. So if I wanted to get rid of the number three on my list, I can do cities.remove and then pass in three, and then it's going to remove the number three. So the argument that you're passing into the remove method is not an index number, but the actual value. So if I wanted to remove Las Vegas, I would have to type in Las Vegas. If I wanted to remove Seattle, I'd have to type in Seattle. In this case, I'm just going to remove the number three. So I'm going to type in the number three. And now when I print it out, 
the three is no longer in the list. So far in my earlier examples, I've shown you how to create the elements of a list by typing in the values directly into your code. You can also create an empty list first and then add elements to it later. So for example, I'll create a list of counties, but I'll leave it empty. And then afterwards, I'll add a value. Another way to create a list is to convert an other object that contains the elements of interest. This other object must be an iterable. Sequences are examples of iterables, which includes strings, lists, and tuples. The built-in list function creates a list from the elements in an iterable. So for example, I'll create a string variable road equals Colorado Boulevard. Then I'll make a road list and then I'll use the list function and use the road variable as the argument. So now when I print road list, it converts every element of the string into a list element. So basically the list function creates a list that consists of every character in the string. One limitation is that you can't convert a number into a list. So for example, I'll create a variable called length and I'll set the value to 1000. And then I'll try to convert that into a list. So I'll do length list equals, and then I'll use the list function and pass in the length variable. And now when I print it, I get a type error. Int object is not iterable. That means numbers are not sequences, therefore you cannot convert them into lists. Working with tuples. Lists are common in Python, and you'll often use lists when writing geoprocessing scripts, including lists of projects, maps, layers, feature classes, fields, and more. Lists are versatile since you can modify them in many ways. However, sometimes you may want to use a list without allowing its elements to be modified. That's where tuples come in. A tuple is a sequence of elements just like a list, but a tuple is immutable, meaning that it cannot be changed. The syntax of a tuple is simple. Separate a sequence of values with commas and you have a tuple. For example, I'll create a variable called zone, and then I'll just add in a bunch of values separated by commas. So now when I print zone, it returns a tuple, which are indicated by parentheses. I'll check that using the type function. And when I do, I can see that the type is tuple. Though it's not necessary, you can also use parentheses to indicate a tuple. Sometimes using parentheses adds clarity. You can also create a tuple with only one element. And to do this, you'll have to add a comma at the end. Working with tuples is like working with lists. Elements in the tuple have an index, which can be used to obtain specific elements of the tuple. So for example, zone zero is going to return one because one is the first item in the tuple. Because tuples are immutable, they can't be modified. So a lot of operations that you can do with lists, such as deleting, appending, and removing, um, are not supported by tuples.
The only methods that work on tuples are count and index, because these methods do not modify the sequence of elements. Other operations, such as slicing, can be applied, but return a different tuple. So for example, if I sliced zone using the indices 1 and 3, the output is actually a different tuple. The original tuple remains the same as before. The built-in tuple function converts an iterable into a tuple. So for example, I'll create a list of states for California, Washington, and Oregon. Now, when I run the tuple function and pass in states as the argument, I get a tuple with the same values. Like the list function, the tuple function also works on strings and dictionaries, but not on numbers. Dictionaries. There may be times when you want to map a key with a value. For example, suppose you had a list of states and a list of state capitals, and you wanted to be able to use either the capital name or the state name to call the other. So you might try something like this. First, I'll create a list of a few capitals. Then I'll make a list of the corresponding states, and I'll make sure that they're in the same order. So for example, the index for Olympia is zero and the index for Washington is also zero. And I can use these index numbers to retrieve the value from either list. So for example, I'll write states and then in brackets, I'm going to use the index function to call up the value or the index for Olympia. And when I do that, and I run the cell, I get Washington. It works the other way as well. This time, I'll use the state index to pull up the capital. And Carson City is not a state. So I'll go ahead and fix that. Okay, so now I'm grabbing the index from Nevada, and when I run the cell, I'll get Carson City. So you can imagine that trying to establish a relationship between these two lists is prone to error and really cumbersome. If you make any edits to either list, then the index numbers no longer apply. So we have another data type that does this a lot better, and it's called a dictionary. A dictionary is basically a collection of key-value pairs, and we use it to map a key to a value. So we'll take our previous example of capitals and states, and I'll make a dictionary called Capital Lookup. So when you create a dictionary, um, you enclose it in curly braces. Then you start with the key, in this case, I'll put in Washington, and then you follow it with a colon, and then that's going to be the value, Olympia. So Washington is the key, and Olympia is the value. And together, this is referred to as an item in the dictionary. So I'll make one for California, as the key and the value is Sacramento. 
then a key for Oregon, and the value is Salem. And then I'll do Nevada and Carson City. So now when I want to use a state to look up the capital, I can just type in my variable and then the key inside a pair of brackets. And when I run the cell, I get Salem. So I'll do another one. I'll do capital lookup, and this time I will use Washington as the key. And I got an error. So this is a good example of um, how Python is case sensitive. So my lookup was, I used a capital L instead of a lowercase l. Okay, I'll fix that, and I get Olympia. If I try Nevada, I get Carson City. The order in which the items are created in the dictionary do not matter. The dictionary can be modified, and if the pairs of keys and their corresponding values are intact, the dictionary will continue to function. Keep in mind when creating the dictionary that the keys must be unique, but the values don't have to be. For example, I'm going to add uh, Massachusetts to our dictionary. So to do that, I'm going to do the name of the variable, capital lookup, then inside brackets, I'll type in the key, which is going to be Massachusetts. And then I'm going to assign it uh, the value. So it's going to be equal to Salem. OK, so at this point, I should have two keys with the same value. Massachusetts has the value of Salem, and so does Oregon. By the way, Salem is not the capital of Massachusetts. So if I wanted to correct that, I can just create another assignment statement. Capital Lookup Massachusetts is equal to Boston. And I'll just test that out to confirm the change. You can also delete items in a dictionary. So I can use the Delete keyword, D-E-L, capital lookup, and then pass in Massachusetts. So now when I print the dictionary, Massachusetts is not in there. Dictionaries come with several methods built in. So you have the keys method, which returns a view object that displays a list of all the keys in a dictionary. There is also the values method, which returns a view object that displays a list of all the values in a dictionary. And finally, there's the items method, which returns a view object that displays a list of all the items in a dictionary, that is, all the key value pairs. Dictionaries and lists have several characteristics in common. Both are mutable, which means elements can be added or removed. Both can be nested, which means that a list can contain a list, a list can contain a dictionary, a dictionary can contain a list, and so on. Lists and dictionaries are different, however, in how elements are accessed. List elements are accessed by their position in the list. 
whereas dictionary elements are accessed by their key. In addition, lists are considered sequences, and the elements are sorted on the basis of how the list was created. Dictionaries are not sequences, and the elements are not ordered. Next, I'll talk about sets. Python includes another data type to organize elements called a set. A set is an unordered collection of elements without duplicates. This characteristic makes a set like a list, but there is no order to the elements. And the elements of a set are unique. Creating a set is like creating a list or a tuple, but the elements are enclosed with braces. So for example, I'll create this set and I'll give it the values 0, 1, 2, and 3. If you create a set with duplicates, the duplicates are automatically removed. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate that. I'll make set 2, and I will give it the values 1, 1, and 1. So now when I print set 2, it only returns one value, a single one. Elements of a set must be immutable, which includes integers, floats, strings, and tuples. A set can also be created by converting a list or a tuple using the set function. For example, I'll create a list of three letters, and then I'll use the set function on the list. As you can see, when I print it, the set does not maintain the order that I used for my list. When working with strings and sets, there are some distinctions that you have to be aware of. So in this first example, I'll create set three, and I'm going to set that equal to the word geographic. So the word or the string geographic is one item in the set. However, if I use the set function and I pass in a variable that has the same value, then you'll see that I get a different result. When you use the set function, every unique character becomes an element of the set. It's possible to create an empty set but empty curly braces are interpreted as an empty dictionary, so the only way to create an empty set is to use the set function. So here I'll create a variable new set, and I'll have that equal to the set function with nothing in it. And when I check the type, it comes out as set. One of the strengths of sets is they can be easily manipulated using various operators. So what I'll do is I'll create uh, two sets with uh, some random numbers, and only a few numbers will be the same in both sets. So now I can use the union operator, which creates a set that consists of all the elements of either set. And notice there's no duplicates. I can also get the intersection of the two sets using the ampersand as the intersect operator. So as you can see, this returns only the numbers that exist in both sets. I can also get the difference between two sets using the minus sign. So in this instance, it's going to subtract 
all the numbers from set four that exist in set five. A set is mutable just like a list and can be modified using the same type of methods, including add, pop, remove, and update. However, a set does not support indexing because the elements of a set are not ordered. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more videos and tutorials related to geospatial science. Thank you.